as we visited the island communities or the bustling markets of Garopa or the major cities of Port Moresby and Leigh or in Enga and I remember the boat ride from uh, Booker on the way to Arawa. Every time I went back to PNG there was a new experience and so much more to learn and to experience. And in fact, I'm often asked what was my favourite place to visit as Foreign Minister of Australia. And I think I made about 150 official visits to over 100 nations in my five years as Foreign Minister. And I always say, Papua New Guinea, there's nowhere like it in the world. Now, my topic today is why Australia should invest more in PNG. And I know there's going to be furious agreement in the room. Um, Minister Maru and I have been speaking about this topic, and we agree there should be more Australian investment in PNG. It's just a question of how we do it. Now, the Australian people, through the Australian government, have long supported development in PNG through our foreign aid budget. This year, as Minister Conroy said, it will be about $600 million. But the Australian private sector has also long supported development in PNG. The Australian government cannot and does not tell Australian business where to invest, but Australian businesses choose to invest in PNG and the current investment is around $24 billion. And that's a significant amount, but we need to increase that sum. As Foreign Minister, one of my earliest commitments was to move the relationship between PNG and Australia on from aid donor, aid recipient, to equal economic partners. And that is a vision that not only the Australian government has, but I know is shared by PNG. Papua New Guinea is master of its own destiny and its political leaders, ever since independence, have taken PNG along that journey. Now, at the last election, the theme was very much on economic resilience and growth. And Prime Minister Marape received a resounding mandate and I congratulate him and his team for forming government. They have a wonderful opportunity to realise that vision. In fact, I first heard Prime Minister Marape talk about his vision for PNG. It was back in July of 2019. He'd just become Prime Minister and he spoke at the Lowy Institute here in Australia. And he welcomed Australia's commitment to foreign aid. He said PNG needed it, but he had a vision, an aspiration that within 10 years, PNG would no longer need Australian foreign aid because it would be economically self-sufficient, resilient and economically independent. And I remember he spoke about embracing technology and innovation and downstream processing and manufacturing and building the human capital in PNG so that the people could help the development and modernisation of the PNG economy. And again, in his most recent speech to Parliament after becoming Prime Minister on the 9th of August this year, he spoke about a pledge he would make to the people of PNG that he would achieve that level of economic independence that previous leaders had achieved with political independence. And that is a magnificent vision that we very much admire. And his Connect PNG policy is so exciting because he's identified areas of focus where I know Australian business has expertise and will have great interest in partnering with PNG. He spoke about uh, roads and airports and wharves and communications, the internet, energy, um, healthcare, education, forestry, agricultural, fishing and tourism all these areas which will be of enormous interest to Australian investors, private sector investors. Now, as 
special advisor to Twinza Oil, the owner and operator and developer of Pask A. I was so heartened to hear the Prime Minister speak today again about his vision for economic resilience and sustainability. And I'm so excited that Twinza is one of the five. We're the fourth P in the list of projects that uh, the Prime Minister has committed to working constructively with us as resource license holders, Twinza, Pasca A and others are keen to develop their projects so that it can realise the potential for the people of PNG. Of course there's a return on investment, but it's also about developing the communities in which you operate. And the opportunity can't be lost because it's about jobs, it's about growth, it's about sustainability. Now, obviously, Australian investors are also excited about the special economic zone concept. And I think that there are many opportunities for Australians to work in these areas that the Prime Minister has identified as needing urgent focus. And so that's really exciting. And we're also very keen to see PNG diversify its economy. As the Prime Minister has also indicated, there is a need to diversify. Sure, there are significant projects underway in the mining, resources, energy space. But as the Managing Director of Mineral Resources Authority said, Jerry Gary said the other day, PNG has to plan for a time when the current mining projects are depleted. And there is so much potential for more projects in other areas. Uh, the United States Geological Survey, which is a global survey, has identified even more potential in oil reserves, oil exploration. There's of course a whole issue of renewable energy and PNG is exquisitely placed in terms of hydroelectric power, in terms of um, hydrogen and green hydrogen. PNG is brilliantly placed to expand in that area. And I was particularly pleased to hear the Prime Minister talk about tourism because this is an area where we could partner much more closely with PNG and I had the opportunity to talk to the Tourism Minister just before lunch. Australians are great travellers. They love travelling around the world. But when it comes to PNG, they often see it through the prism of historic visits like Kokoda Track. And while that's very important, there's so much more that we could partner with PNG in relation to uh, ecotourism. Sensitive, careful, considered, environmentally friendly, ecologically sustainable tourism. The beautiful environment, the coastal beaches, the coral reefs, these are all areas where international operators, Australian operators and developers could partner with PNG to ensure that PNG also gets the benefit of the tourism dollar. I was recently at a design conference in London, art, culture, design, fashion, and I was struck by one exhibition of the Billum. And there in London, a woman had brought along Billums from PNG, not just as practical accessories, but as high fashion items. And there was enormous interest of these beautiful pieces of, um, of work done by women in the Highlands. And I thought, well, there you go. That is a global handicraft. There's an opportunity for something so intrinsically Papua New Guinean to be on the world stage. And hey, I was at dinner last night when Minister Conroy virtually guaranteed, he's not here so I can verbal him, virtually guaranteed that the PNG hunters will be in the NRL and just think of the investment opportunities that that will bring. Beyond rugby, it will have enormous potential for growth in PNG under the banner of sports diplomacy. Now, this brings me to the specific issue of foreign direct investment. And many nations around the world 
have harnessed the benefits of foreign direct investment. But it's a very challenging time for us all. Let me put this in context. We all know that foreign direct investment is good for growing economies. No country on the planet is able to develop large-scale infrastructure and large-scale projects without bringing in capital from elsewhere. No country has the domestic capital to build these large-scale projects. The IMF recently listed the top 10 recipients of foreign direct investment. So these are the countries that receive the most foreign direct investment to build their economies. Number one, the United States. Number two, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, China, the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland, Ireland, Germany. These are some of the biggest economies in the world and they are receiving the most foreign direct investment. So my point is that the United States is the largest receiver of foreign direct investment. Cumulatively, it's about five trillion US dollars. Yes, the US is also the most significant outward bound investor. That's valued at about cumulatively six trillion US dollars. In Australia's case, we're up there. Our foreign direct investment cumulatively is valued at about $2.7 trillion and our outflows about $2.2 trillion. But this foreign direct investment that Australia has received has helped us build the 14th largest economy in the world, even though we're 56th when it comes to population. And foreign direct investment has helped us build the iron ore industry the gas industry in the Northwest Shelf, and now the new lithium projects. And the, these exports of commodities has supported Australia's economy for decades now. And so the whole notion of foreign direct investment has to be seen in the context of who we're competing against. Papua New Guinea and Australia in trying to attract foreign direct investment we're competing against the United States, European countries, significant economies, and capital is mobile. It's global. It will go to the most attractive destination. And that means that countries like Australia have had to ensure that we are a welcoming environment because capital will go somewhere else. If they don't like it, if they don't feel welcome, they'll go somewhere else. That's why we focus on our taxation regime and our regulatory regime. It has to be competitive against some of the biggest economies in the world. And that also includes the pace of approvals. Now, I know this very well because my consulting firm, Murray's my, Murray Wade, Murray's my business partner, you might know him as my, he was my chief of staff when I was foreign minister. Well, Murray and I are consulting to a mining company that's working in the United States. And it's taken quite a while for them to get approvals. And the state of California has now legislated to ensure that any approvals have to be determined within 270 days of the application being made. That's because the state of California is competing with other states in the United States as well as other countries for that capital to build those projects. And I think we're going to see more nations around the world impose regulatory time frames, and this is putting pressure on their public servants, their civil servants, to process applications within specific time frames. Even in New South Wales, in the housing sector, the New South Wales government has imposed a requirement that applications for housing development have to be resolved within 40 days, 90% within 40 days. So this is a significant area of competition. And I think that we have to appreciate that capital will go to the most welcoming environment. So let me talk about another aspect 
of Australia's approach to foreign investment. I would never presume to advise the PNG government on its approach. All I can do is talk about the experience that Australia had and maybe there are some lessons to be learned from what we've done in Australia. But we've also got a foreign investment review board. A number of countries have different ways of filtering foreign direct investment applications. And our foreign investment review board is comprised of people from very different backgrounds, from politics, from business, from small business, uh, from the not-for-profit sector. So we have a board and they give advice to the treasurer who then ultimately makes a decision about whether a foreign direct investment application will be approved. And FERB focuses on um, residential applications to, you know, to buy housing, on mining projects, on agricultural projects and the like. And the reason we have the Foreign Investment Review Board is it can take into account whether a proposed investment is in the national interest and then can take into account national security concerns. So, for example, FERB has a threshold. Applications of a certain value go to FERB for analysis. In the case of an application for investment from a state-owned enterprise, that automatically goes to the Foreign Investment Review Board. There's no dollar value because, of course, national security concerns are paramount when it's an application from a foreign or a state-owned enterprise. Now, I think you might be interested to learn the statistics from the Foreign Investment Review Board in terms of approvals for investment. In the 2020-2021 year, there were 7,614 applications for approval to invest in projects in Australia. 7,614 in one year. A number withdrew and a number were exempt. But finally, the Foreign Investment Review Board had to process 6,651 applications for investment into Australia. And do you know how many were approved of the 6,651? 6,650. Only one application was not approved. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the investment in Australia. And just those applications were worth $233 billion into the Australian economy. In the time remaining, I'm going to quote from Austrade because I don't think there's a better summary of how foreign direct investment has benefited Australia than this extract. Australia's economy has outperformed its peers for more than two decades and the country is achieving great success in global industries. Investment from overseas helps stimulate our economy's growth, creates local jobs and drives our modernisation. Foreign direct investment is woven into our daily lives from roads and public transport to technology used in phones or computers. Foreign direct investment helps power some of Australia's leading industries, creating more opportunities and jobs. It supports local businesses, develops infrastructure and builds regional economies and drives greater competitiveness, innovation and productivity through new technologies. I know that that is the vision PNG has for its country. And I know that Australia wants to partner even more with PNG to help it realise its vast potential. And I certainly look forward to my discussion with Minister Maru so that we can ensure that everyone in this room is as passionate and committed to investing in PNG as Australian business should be. Thank you.